Would you stand to your feet? Put your hands together. Come on. This is no performance. Lord, I pray it's worship. Empty words I can't afford. I'm not chasing feelings. That's not why I'm singing. You're the reason for my song. If I sing for you, my King, oh, I can't imagine why I put to this all for high, cause it's all If I sing with everything, if I sing for you, my King, oh, I can't imagine why I would do this all for high, cause it's all
but you can't stop there. When we go from glory to glory to glory, we'll never be the same. We'll never be the same. You take us high, high, high. We're forever changed, forever changed. We're not worried. Father, we are, Lord, we just thank you for who you are. And we thank you that we can be forever changed, Heavenly Father, by your blood. When you died on that cross to save us. So much we want to do, so much we want to say, Heavenly Father. I just, I just don't even have the words to express the love that we have for you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your, your guidance, for, your, for everything, Lord, for just being you, God. And we worship and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, A2 Church. How are y'all this morning? This is our connect time. Let's reach out a hand, shake someone's hand, hug someone's neck. so glad that you joined us today. I'd like to give a special welcome to our first, second, and third time guests, and if you're joining us online at A2 TV. My name is Josh, and we're so excited to continue worshiping with you today. But before we do that, here are a few things happening at A2 Church. If you are a parent with a baby or infant, we are so glad that you're here. In order to best serve you during the experience, we have several options for you to care for your little ones. We of course have our awesome nursery rooms, which are located in the back of the A2 Kids hallway. And we also have a homey mother's room located right next to the exit in the back of the foyer. Seriously, that mother's room is nice. We've put a couple of recliners in there for you, a baby changing station, and even a TV so you don't have to miss any of the message. Please feel free to use any of these options each Sunday morning. Have you been coming to A2 for a while now and have not yet made the decision to become an owner or not sure what an owner is? Well, make sure to join us for Discover A2 where you can discover what A2 is all about and what it means to be an owner. So sign up today on your connection card for Discover A2 Church on January 21st at 10.30 a.m. in the Connect Room. The 2018 Life Groups Directory will be posted on Sunday, January 14th. Our spring semester begins Sunday, January 28th. And if you have any questions about life groups, email Sam Maniscalco, our life groups director, at sam at a2church.org. We will be hosting our first Lunch and Learn for 2018 on January 25th. It's going to be called Values That Win, featuring Wade Lombard, owner and managing partner of Square Cow Movers in Austin, Texas. Square Cow leads with values, and they have received the Better Business Bureau Torch Award. They've also been named a two-time finalist for Ethics and Business Award. Our Lunch and Learns are a great way to continue growing as a leader and meet some great people. Lunch is always served. The cost for the entire experience is only $10, and it includes lunch and your learning materials. Lunch starts at 11.30 and the learning at 12. On January 28th at 6 p.m., we will be having a night of worship and healing. You're not going to want to miss this incredible evening of worship, prayer, teaching, and healing ministry with world-renowned cardiologist Dr. Chauncey Crandall. Mark your calendars and get here early. We expect a packed house. 
Water baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. It doesn't save you, but it's a public declaration that a person has moved from being a seeker to being a believer in what Jesus did for them through his cross and resurrection. If you're interested in taking your next step or you have any questions, email me at jpower at a2church.org. Our next baptism opportunity will be January 21st in both worship experiences. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope that God is able to minister to you through today's worship experience. Good morning, A2 Church. So we are so glad to have every single one of you guys here, but especially if you're a guest or watching via A2 TV. So the only thing we ask our guests to do is to fill out a connection card, which is in the seat back in front of you. And we're not gonna be weird or like hunt you down or anything. We just wanna know that you're here. So fill that out with your prayer needs and all that good stuff. And for anybody else in the room, this is a great time to prepare God's tithe and our offerings. So while you do that, I have two announcements for you guys. Our 21 days of prayer is continuing this week. And this is such an amazing time to just devote ourselves to prayer, just being thankful and watchful for all that God's doing and just expecting a move from God. Honoring God with focus and purposeful prayer at the beginning of the year is just the perfect way to like set the tone for all of 2018. So we hope you guys will all join in because it's literally life-changing. We have a focus and a verse for each day. So be sure you grab a program so that you know, so that we're all praying with one mind and one heart as A2 Church and as the body of Christ as a whole. Next up, if you wanna get more in depth with your walk with God, or maybe just learn more about scripture, the School of the Spirit is the perfect way to do that. So last Sunday, we had an amazing turnout and amazing feedback on the School of Spirit lesson on speaking in the spiritual language, is like speaking in tongues. It was a really powerful night and everybody loved it. So I hope you guys come out tonight and hear about the gift of prophecy. If you're curious about it, or maybe just wanna come and learn more and grow deeper in your knowledge, be sure that you come out tonight. And that's all I have for you guys. So I'm gonna hand it back to the worship team for another song. Hey guys, that's Skylar Arrington, a student leader with RA2 students. Didn't she do a fabulous job? We're just gonna continue in worship. Praise is the highway to the throne of God. Praise is the highway to the heart of God. Praise is the highway to the move of God.
more time. Sing it out. Let's clap our hands loudly to God. The Bible says clap your hands, all God's people. Shout to God with triumphant praise. Let's do that. Let's do that. Amen. Father, thank you so much for who you are and for all you have done and are doing. I know in our time as we dive into your word, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And if you're comfortable in saying it out loud, say aloud, amen. 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 You may be seated. Hey, Aaron Hoover, would you please come up? Yeah, James, hang out with me, please. There you go. Um, I always like for you to see this. You need to know... Every time you give, every time you give, 10% of what you give, we invest in ministries, missions outside A2 Church. And occasionally we get to have missionaries through that we support. And Aaron and his lovely wife, Susie. Susie, would you please stand up? Susie, that's Susie. This is Aaron and Susie. We have our daughter in the back. Yeah, what's, what's your daughter's name? Eleni. Say it again. Eleni. Uh, make sure he's on right here. Uh, we may need to turn it on. There it is. Uh, what's her name again? Eleni. Eleni. So Eleni is back in the back. Would you welcome Aaron, Susie, and Eleni? Every month we send them a gift. And I want Aaron tell the people where you are, what God has been doing through you, Susie, Eleni, the ministry you have there in Athens since the last time we got to see you. We've uh, been living in Athens, Greece for the last two and a half years or so, and we've been uh, specifically focused on the unreached people groups that are flooding into Greece uh, from uh, places like Syria and Iraq, as well as Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran. And, uh, and we've just been receiving these people, uh, serving them with their needs, and, and then now what we're really trying to do is, is come out of a place of relief work and move into a community development phase. So we're opening up micro businesses, we're opening up jobs and education opportunities, teaching them English and different things. We're helping them through paperwork, legal stuff that's happening in, in Greece. Um, and then we're also trying to open up housing opportunities for them as well. And all of this is because we want them to know how much God loves them and we want them to go deep in their walk with the Lord and, uh, and what's been really happening since the last time we saw you guys, we, we've had this vision from the beginning. And the, the question we had was, well, what's the first step, God? You know, like we, we have this big, huge thing on our heart to do. How do we do it? What's the first step? And uh, about a year and a half ago, we really felt like the Lord would say, develop a culture of intimacy with me. Yes. And, uh, and so as we began to dive into that, we just realized that God was calling us personally as a family, as well as calling his body among the city of Athens to come close to him. And, uh, and, and, and we found that actually as we're serving people, as we, as we get caught up in the work, it, it can be very easy to, to fall into kind of a religious spirit where we just do, 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 do. And we get our order kind of out of line and, and we miss God. We mm. forget about this, this intimacy with him. Yeah. And so we started organizing uh, regular uh, monthly corporate worship gatherings in the city. And so we did that a few times and tried to build interest in, hey, let's come together. You know, let's, let's come together. It doesn't matter what background you're from. Let's worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we spent the last year organizing a month of prayer in, in Greece. And so we were networking with churches all over the country we tried to call pastors around the country to a national month of prayer. And that was this past November. We, uh, we had for 30 straight days in the city of Athens, nonstop prayer and worship, 24 oh, hours a day. 
And uh, it was the largest prayer meeting that Greece has ever known in their history. That's what pastors <laughs> told us. Amen. And you know, we, we, I, I got to be honest, we were excited about it. We know the power of prayer. We know the power of worship. Just what we just saying really is the highway. And, uh, but, but, you know, I, I got to admit, we kind of went into it a little blind, you know? Like we, the question we had going into it is what would happen if for 30 days nonstop, we just magnified the Lord, mm. what would happen? Mm-hmm. And man, I can just tell you story after story after story without doing any evangelism, anything like that. People coming to know Christ, people encountering the presence of the Lord like they've never experienced before. Hey, Jesus. Broken relationships being mended, reconciliation happening in the room, nations coming together. The very final night of the month, we had about 30 nations represented in the room. We had worship in Farsi as the Iranians danced before the Lord and everyone in the room with their cell phones up in the air videoing this move of God. We had Filipinos on the stage worshiping. We had English, Farsi, Greek worship all in one night. It was an amazing time. And now we're experiencing this momentum, this momentum of prayer and worship and intimacy with the Father. And we feel like there are foundations being laid now that we can be building on. Yes. And, uh, and so that's the next season we're stepping into. Yay, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Anybody excited about that? Now, if, if, if I'm hearing you right, and we've talked, so I'm, I think I am. When you, when you talk about the crisis, you're talking specifically about the refugee crisis. The refugee crisis, and then also the, there's been an ongoing financial crisis in Greece. So the, yeah. the, the, the nation is more or less bankrupt, and so we find many, many Greeks who have been humbled, which is a good thing, actually. Mm. Uh, and, and they're now really being open to something new. You hey, know? Jesus. You guys support Aaron and Susie every month. And I love us hearing these stories. I want to ask you for a favor. Would you and Susie this morning be a part of our prayer team when we get ready to pray for people? I'd love for you guys to anoint people. Sure. And, uh, and then you're going to be here for the next experience. We haven't got yeah. to talk this morning. Yeah, I'd, I'd love absolutely. for the next crowd. Yeah, to, yeah, Thank you, dude. If you'll set that down on the front seat, somebody will need that in a minute, I'm sure. So, uh, yay, God. Give it Aaron and Susie a big hand. Whew. You know, this is a word. Just stay with me, James, for just a second. This is a word that, that came, and uh, I'm not a great multitasker. So... Um, I just want to read this word that someone received as we were worshiping. I've so enjoyed you this morning. This is Father God speaking to us. Remember, praise is a two-way street. You praise me and I, God, get the love on you. Praise, ask, and watch Daddy God hear and listen. It's time for gifts, gifts for my precious sons and daughters. I just sensed that. I've sensed ever since I pulled onto this campus uh, a really powerful awareness that God's with us this morning. Now, he's present everywhere at all times. We know that. But there are times when the manifest presence of God is, is more apt to be experienced by a group of people. And I feel that in this room this morning. Father, we just surrender all to you and ask that you anoint the teaching of your word. I need you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, um, take out the notes that are contained in your program, please. And uh, we printed for you uh, a catalog. We gave you so much more than we can possibly cover this morning because I want to attempt something incredibly aggressive. Um, I want to try to give you a panoramic 30,000-foot overview, flyover, of the entire Sermon on the Mount. And that is incredibly aggressive. And we'll see how much we get to. By the way, I was feeling so uncertain about how much I would get to. And because I wanted to make certain we didn't limit the the movement of the Holy Spirit, for those of you who must have every blank filled in, I actually gave you an answer key at the end of the notes. So if we cut things off like three points in, you've got an answer key. Chill out. It's cool. 
Now, a little girl was talking to her mom after church one Sunday morning and said this to her mom, Mom, I am confused about something. And the mom said, well, baby, baby, what is it? What we learned today in A2 Kids, God is big, like, like, like really, really, really big, like so big that he holds the whole world in his hand. Is that true, Mom? And she said, yeah, it's, it's true, babe. It's, God is big, really big. Well, we, we also learned, though, that when we ask Jesus to come in our heart, that God comes to live inside us. Is that true? And mom was feeling a little bit proud at this time. She said, yeah, it is true. When you ask Jesus in, God comes to live in. She, she looked back at mom and said, well, mom, if, if God is that big, that huge, big enough to hold the whole world and he comes to live inside us, don't you think some of him would show through? Now, now let, me, let me wrap up the Sermon on the Mount for you right like this. The Sermon on the Mount is about God showing through. It's about the people who follow Jesus, people who want to live in the kingdom of God, becoming so dynamically aware of the kingdom of God that God starts to show through in everything. Now, here's the setup if you missed last week. Jesus walks on the scene. And immediately when he hits the scene, he begins to announce, repent, change your mind, metanoia. The kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. And this is his message. This is the message of the gospels. And if you don't get that, you will never get the gospels. The word kingdom shows up 126 times in the gospels, sometimes referred to as kingdom of God, other times kingdom of heaven. They are synonymous. They mean the same thing. And Jesus shows up announcing the kingdom of God. That's Matthew 4, 17. Matthew 4, 23. He, after calling his initial core followers, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, Peter, Andrew, James, John, they begin to follow. Jesus, with his core followers, continues to preach his core message, the kingdom of God has come, but he goes a step further here. And instead of just teaching kingdom, he begins to demonstrate kingdom. And I printed the verses for you in your notes. Matthew 4, 24, 25, he begins healing everyone. And I love the way the passage translation reads. It reads like this, everyone who was brought to Jesus, he healed. Now, this is really cool. Track with me. Look, you might want to jot this down. Matthew 4 is all about action, Jesus doing. Matthew 8, Matthew 9, all about action, Jesus doing, what he does, how active he is. Sandwiched in between Jesus doing is Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus teaching. Now, now people, this is profound. This tells me when it comes to following Jesus, it's not an either or proposition. It's not I submit to Jesus' teaching, yeah, he gave us a great way of life, let's follow what he taught. And it's not the opposite, Jesus did incredible things, let's just do what Jesus did. When it comes to following Jesus, it's incredibly important that we have both. We have both word and demonstration. We have both teaching and power. We have both truth and God showing up to do what only God can do. And when there's this incredible, when there's this incredible combination of both, we become irresistible to the world. This is, this is what the Gospels are all about. Now, the message is the kingdom of God. And I gave you, I think I printed it for you in your notes, best definition I know of for the kingdom of God. If I didn't, I know it would come up on the screen. Here's what Dallas Willard defined as kingdom of God. He says, it's the range of God's effective will. It's where whatever God wants done gets done. 
And Jesus shows up. And what does he do? He begins healing the sick. He begins raising the dead. He begins confronting demonic oppression. And if the kingdom really is the range of God's effective will, wherever what God wants done gets done, or my best attempt at a definition, life in the presence of God, life under the rule, power, reign of God, what Jesus is doing when he shows up and begins declaring kingdom of God, kingdom of God, and then demonstrating kingdom of God in actions, in miracles, he's, he's telling us something. Where the rule and reign of God is, poverty loses its grip. Where the rule and reign of God exists, Sickness and death have to go on sick leave. They go to the morgue. Where the rule of God shows up, love overcomes hate. Beauty overcomes chaos and disorder. Where the kingdom of God shows up, peace overwhelms all of our brokenness. That's what the kingdom of God is, and that's what I came to bring. So... Matthew 4, it's, it's announcing repent. Kingdom of God is here and then demonstrating it. Matthew 8, 9, it's demonstrating it once again. Matthew 5, 7, it's describing it. And if there's one word that describes what happens when people live under the rule, reign, presence, power of God... When people really begin to live out the kingdom, if there's one word that describes it, it's this word, different. Radically, completely, right side up in an upside down world different. Now here's the 30,000 foot overview. Uh, here's what I want to challenge you to do for the next few weeks while we're in Matthew 5, 7. I'm challenging you to read through Matthew 5 through 7 five times each week. You can do it in about 15 minutes. And I challenge you, begin with a New Living Translation. The next day, read the message. The next day, read the NIV. The next day, read the message and come back to the New Living Translation. I challenge you, read it visually with your eyes, words on a page. And I challenge you, take the uversion.com Bible app, load it onto your phone, and listen to it audibly. This morning in the drive from my house near Bluff Park to here, I listened through in the NLT, I 2 x it. I listened through it. In the NLT and the message, I've already read it several times this week. I was amazed at how it just broke my heart again listening on the way up. It made me so hungry to see the kingdom of God formed in me. So, so let's try this. Let's try the 30,000 foot flyover. You ready? You're going to have to work if we're going to do this. Are, are you ready to work? Amen. Sherry is... I'm going to ask it one more time because right now I'm feeling just a little insecure. Are you ready to work? Yes. <laughs> it's really cool. Jesus starts out the sermon with this word, bless. And the word blessed is such an awesome word, but it's so misused and overused in 2018. Right? The word blessed has almost become cliche. For instance, think about this social media post. Alabama wins their 17th national championship. Hashtag blessed. Now, I just want to ask you, is that really what the word blessed is all about? Because if it is, there are a lot of other schools in the SEC and a lot of other schools in various conferences around the U.S. who must be thinking, I am hashtag cursed because we haven't seen that in decades. Yes, amen. Or we've got phrases like this. How about this one? To bless, to be stressed. <laughs> By the way, that's not just a saying. It is a song. It is actually several songs, none of them very good. 
I looked at that this week and I thought, that is a great rap song. And I even tried my hand at it. I am too blessed to be stressed. When the devil tries to mess, I must confess that God has blessed me going out and coming in. No matter the score, I will win. Greater is the one who is in me than the one trying to make me sin. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I know it's bad. (laughs) All those who love real rap music are saying, please don't give up your day job. (laughs) If someone sneezes, what do we say? Yeah. In the South, we even use the word for people we don't really like. We will say, God bless her heart. (laughs) Translation, I hate her guts. I wish she'd leave. (laughs) And we say it all with a smile on our face, right? The biblical word blessed is power. Now here it is. It'll come up on the screen. It means blessed, happy, blissful, fortunate, flourishing. Ian Duguid, written an incredible book just on the Beatitudes, says, blessed is the kind of person we envy, want to be like, the kind of person who is our hero. Max Licato, in his excellent book on the Beatitudes called The Applause of Heaven, walks it out like this. He says, blessed is sacred delight. And listen to how he defines sacred delight. Sacred delight is good news coming through the back door of your heart. It's what you'd always dreamed but never expected. It's the too good to be true coming true. It's having God as your pinch hitter, your lawyer, your dad, your biggest fan, and your best friend. God on your side, in your heart, out in front, protecting your back. That's blessed. It is sacred because only God can grant it. It's delight because it's thrill. Since it's sacred, it can't be stolen. Since it's delight, it can't be predicted. That's blessed. Jesus begins the greatest sermon ever given with the word blessed. And then here's what he does. We'll come back to the introduction at the end. He says, when you begin to live life in the kingdom of God, life under my rule, my reign, it's going to affect every area of your life. So I'm going to give you 10, yes, 10. So to do it successfully, we've got to do that in not many minutes. So let's hit every area. You ready? I'm not going to read every verse. I printed every verse in your notes. And the reason I printed them this morning, I want to give you the flyover because it's only by seeing the whole that when we zero down on each of these passages, they'll come to make more sense. So here's the flyover. Hitting reset in 10 areas that evidently matter to Jesus because he addresses them all. And by the way, with each area, I gave you, I gave you the passages that align with that area, our mission. When a new coach, new CEO takes over, one of the first things a new coach, new CEO does is he goes back to the basics like Vince Lombardi and says, this is a football and the new coach, new CEO begins to take the team, the company back to mission, values, purpose. And that's exactly what Jesus does in Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are salt, you are light. Now, in the first century, salt was a preservative. Light was essential. When Jesus called a salt light, he was saying, if you're going to follow me, live in my kingdom, when you see deterioration or disintegration in this world, you don't run from it. In fact, you run towards it. Because you're to be a preservative in this messed up world. If you're going to bring my revolution, look for ways to be salt in broken places. Look for ways to be light in really dark places. In fact, he summed it up like this. Verse number 16. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and then glorify your father in heaven. That's mission. Second area, our standard and true source. In verses 17, 18, Jesus talks about his commitment to the law. He says, I didn't come to destroy the law. Know this, I came to fulfill the law. In fact, heaven and earth can disappear, but not one, not one of the smallest details, my law will disappear. 
Uh, Jesus says right up front, I'm committed to God's law. I'm committed to the prophets. What I'm not committed to, though, is the distorted teaching coming out of a religious community about the law. In fact, check out verse 20. It's in your notes. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom. Boom. Jesus is picking a fight. Here's what he's picking a fight with. He's picking a fight with religion. I don't know if you know this or not, but religion and Christianity are not synonymous. See, Jesus knows this. Religion will always produce either pride or despair. Pride when you think you've got it right. And this was the problem with the Pharisees and teachers of the law. They thought they were God's gift to humanity. They thought they had it right. Despair when you realize this, like the people, the Pharisees and teachers of the law taught, they felt like, I can never be right. The standard is too massive. I'm hopeless. Jesus comes on the scene. He obliterates all of that. By the way, by the time Jesus walked on the scene, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, they actually competed with one another as to who could be more strict in keeping the law. They had actually accumulated a complex system of rules, 613 rules. 248 commands, 365 prohibitions. They even added what they called 1,521 recommendations. If you do this, you're righteous. Uh, for instance, they added to the third commandment, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. They added to that by saying, hey, let's make certain we get it right, so let's not even say the name of the Lord our God. Uh, for instance, sexual temptation. They, they added rules to this. They had a practice, get this, this is, I'm not making this up, of lowering their heads when they walked so they wouldn't even have to look at a woman. They were so known for this that some of them, who evidently had a real problem looking, became known as the bleeding Pharisees because they kept walking into walls and other obstacles because they tried to keep their heads down so they wouldn't have to look. Oh, when it came to working on the Sabbath, they actually comprised a list of 39 things that were considered working, and they were insane, uh, insane when it came to this. Jesus comes on the scene, he blows to smithereens all of these little nitpicky rules. Let me just say something to us in the room, because this is the problem with religion. If you're too spiritual for Jesus, if you're too spiritual for the Bible, you, my brother or sister, are too spiritual. Chill out. Take some Xanax or something. Wind down. Jesus even said this. You've heard it said. He says that at least six times in the Sermon on the Mount. This is interesting. He didn't say you've heard that it was written. Why? Because Jesus elevated what had been written. What he tears to smithereens is the misteaching of Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law. You've heard that it was said, but I say. And then he gives us truth. Now, I took a lot more time with Jesus' commitment to the law than these others that I'm going to fly over. And here's the reason why. If you don't get that mindset, that what Jesus is doing is hitting reset on hundreds of years of conventional wisdom, hundreds of years of sacred cows, hundreds of years of misteaching, you won't get the sermon when you read it. Third area, it'll come up on the screen, our relationship with people. Jesus takes on stuff like anger, name-calling, hurling insults, posting memes on your social media feed that strip people of dignity. He takes on holding grudges, harboring resentment, hanging on to unforgiveness, says that this stuff matters to God. In his reasoning, people matter to God, and they ought to matter to you and me. He goes so far as to say, you need to extend forgiveness, pursue reconciliation, work towards restoration. Why? People matter to God and they ought to matter to you and me. 
That's people. Four, sexual purity and commitment in marriage. He deals with that. He elevates the sexual ethic. Jesus says that sex is about a whole lot more than physical pleasure, personal gratification, excitement. It's about, he says, connection and intimacy. Jesus challenges us in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't give your body to someone until you're willing to give your entire life to them as well. Sex is so powerful and explosive, he says. It only works within the context of marriage. So don't do something with your body that you're not willing to to do with your entire life. Don't become physically naked until you're ready to become spiritually and emotionally naked within the context of marriage. And then Jesus elevates marriage as well. Did you know in the first century, a Jewish man could divorce his wife simply by saying three times these things out loud. I divorce you. I divorce you. I divorce you. That's how trivial divorce had become in the first century. And Jesus walks on the scene and he elevates marriage. And he says, this matters to God. It's got to matter to you. Fifth area, the integrity of the words we speak and the promises we make. Jesus basically says this, Matthew 5, 37. Every word you say, every little yes, every little no should be absolutely truthful. As absolutely truthful as if you had sworn on a stack of Bibles. Your integrity, your word, your promises matter. Six, our response to hostility, cruelty, and our enemies. (laughs) This is where Jesus says, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. I just want to ask in this congregation, is this our go-to position? Let Let me give you a pop. Let me give you a pop quiz. Let's just see where we are on this thing. I think they can help me in the back. This is a pop quiz. Here's the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. If somebody strikes you on the cheek, your response should be A, smack them upside the head. B, turn the other cheek and allow a second blow. If he strikes you a third time, smack them upside the head because Jesus said once, twice. He didn't say anything about three. Third option in this list, let him hit you until his arms get tired. Just go all Muhammad Ali rope-a-dope on the dude. Just, just let him wear himself out. Fourth, respond with wisdom, strength, and compassion, refusing to act on the impulse to inflict retaliatory pain. Or fifth, Call Jeff Rush, Wes Harrell, Ron Wiggins, or Link Cassidy and ask Jeff, Wes, Ron, and Link to smack them upside the head. (laughs) Dilly dilly, thank you. (laughs) What's the teaching of Jesus on this? I mean, conventional wisdom says somebody hurt you, hurt them back. But Jesus says, I want my followers to die to that natural response, reflex, and impulse. We live in a culture where retaliatory pain is such a part of the culture that it's the basic storyline in every movie. Jesus says, not my people. Now, now please, please, this is the flyover. We'll walk it out in a few weeks. So I'm not saying always stay in a situation where people can keep hurting you until they get tired of it and then go away. What I am saying is this, Christians give up the right to get even. Christians say the kingdom of love that I've been called to is bigger than my need to inflict retaliatory pain. Seven, the way we care for the poor. It's interesting, Jesus assumes we're going to care for the poor. He just assumes we will, but he says this, when you do it, don't do it in a condescending way. In my kingdom, Jesus says, look at, treat, respect the poor as your equal. Your attitude is important. Never give to the poor in a condescending, proud, self-congratulatory, patronizing way. Treat other people the way you want to be treated Eight, our prayer and spiritual life, which is critically important. We read Matthew 6, 5 through 18, 7, 7 through 11. It's all about prayer and fasting. And here's the gist. The religious community in the first century had turned this into a performance. And Jesus bottom lines it and says, hey, it's this simple. Be real and be personal. 
Be real with God. You don't have to role play before God. And be personal. Make this a part of your intimate life with God. Nine, our attitudes about money, possessions, and worry. You know Jesus is going to go there, right? Let me just ask you this question. Where do you spend your money effortlessly? (laughs) Amazon just came out of Derek. (laughs) I asked Zach Walker that question and he said (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Here's the point. We all have one or two areas that our money effortlessly flows towards. That's your storehouse. And it might be your house, your car, entertainment, food, education, Amazon, Chick-fil-A. Whatever your money flows effortlessly towards is your storehouse. It is your functional savior in God. And that's why if you find it difficult to give 10%, 15%, or 20% of your income to the mission of God and to people around you, it's because your storehouse is something other than the kingdom of God. On the other hand, if consistent, radical generosity shows up in your life, it could be an indication that the kingdom of God has come to live in you and through you. Ten. Our priorities. Jesus bottom lines everything in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now, everybody look this way for just a moment. But by the way, by the way, can you believe we just did that? Amen. We walked through the entire Sermon on the Mount in like 20 minutes. If you don't accomplish anything else this year, you just did that. Give yourself a hand. That's big. That's the flyover. But it's worth nothing if we don't apply it. So here's the question. Are you ready? It's not in your notes. That's why I wanted you to look at me. A great question to ask yourself on a regular basis is this. Am I living in the kingdom? Am I living life in the presence of God under the power, rule, reign of God daily? Am I living in the big kingdom of God or the little kingdom of me? Can you imagine, can you imagine asking yourself that question before, before you go ballistic? in that argument with your spouse. Is this about the big kingdom of God or the little kingdom of me? Can you imagine asking yourself that question before you post those unkind comments about someone you don't even know? Is this about the kingdom of God or is it about the little kingdom of me? Can you imagine asking yourself that question before you suit up, put on the boots to go to work Is my job about the big kingdom of God or the little kingdom of me? Am I working in a way that brings great glory to God or am I working in a way as to just get by? That's the little kingdom of me. See, what Jesus wants, oh, he wants the kingdom of God to pervade every aspect of our life. He wants Matthew 6.33 to form every day. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All this stuff gets added and thrown in, but seek first the kingdom of God. Is this about the big kingdom of God or the little kingdom of me? Now, 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 now here's, here's the thought I want to give you. Here's the thought. We read through all of that, and I've been through that several times this week, and when I read through all of it, here's the feeling I get. There's no way I can perfectly live that out. Anybody here feel the same way? Anybody here read that and you feel convicted? You feel challenged and you feel a little bit of, wow, I must have flunked out of Christian school because there's no way I'm walking all that stuff out. Now, let me just say, I'm lifting my hand in reality because that's me. If you read the Sermon on the Mount right, that's the way you read it. That's the way Jesus meant it. 
Martin Luther said, if you read the Sermon on the Mount right, you will be filled with hopelessness and you will say, I must fall on the grace of God. And that's exactly where God wants you to fall. See, God wants you to look at at all of these things and say, oh my gosh, it's never going to happen. And then him come to you and say, you're exactly right if you're living in the little kingdom of you. But if you switch allegiance to the big kingdom of me, remember the kingdom of God is all about the power of God, the presence of God, the life of God, the reign of God, living in that. And when my power comes in, it makes all things possible, especially those things you considered impossible. That's a good word this morning. That's a good word. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the first beatitude as James comes. I'm not going to deal with all all eight. And some people argue that there are nine. Here's here's what I believe. I believe the run on at the end, there's three verses that deal with persecution. I believe they're all part of the same beatitude. Because the way the rhythm rolls. So eight. I'm going to give you the first. Because the first is essential to us getting this right. Remember, Jesus begins with blessed. And here's what he's going to tell us. This is is my big idea. Blessed, Blessed, in Jesus' mind, isn't about the possessions you own. It's about the person you are becoming. And here's the first. Admit your need. We're spiritually bankrupt and totally dependent on God. Jesus begins the Beatitudes with this. Blessed are the poor. Now the word poor there means abject poverty. It's poverty like we can't even imagine. Poverty on a level that escapes our intellect. Poverty is powerful. Poverty will drive you to hopelessness and despair. I'm talking real poverty. But Jesus has got a qualifier in Matthew 5, 3. He not only says, blessed are the poor, but he says this, blessed are, in IV, the poor in spirit. In LT, blessed are the poor, those who realize their need for God. And Dallas Willard says you could actually translate it like this. Blessed are the spiritual zeros, the spiritual, spiritually bankrupt, deprived, deficient, and beggars. Blessed are those who don't know anything about the Bible. Blessed are those who don't know heads or tails about God. Blessed are those who would throw up if you ask them to pray out loud. Blessed are those people because it's when you don't know the first thing about God and admit it that you're most ready to experience God show up in your life. See, to be poor in spirit means this. I admit I'm desperate for God. I don't have anything to offer God. I'm betting the whole farm on grace. That's poor in spirit. And that's the only way you'll live out the kingdom is if you come to God with that mentality. So that's what we're going to do today. You ready? Here's my question. It's the question I felt prompted to pause at. Are you really living in the kingdom of God, the big kingdom of God, or the little kingdom of you? Do you need to switch kingdoms this morning? And by the way, this isn't just a question for those who don't know Jesus, because we can all switch from time to time from big kingdom of God to little kingdom of me. So this is for us all. If you want to switch the big kingdom of God, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You ready? Team, come to the stage. Pray this prayer with me. You won't pray it alone because we're all the faith family here. We're going to pray it out loud. But say this, Heavenly Father, my life too often becomes about me. And this morning, I want the kingdom of God. I want life lived in the rule of God, in the presence of God, 
in the power of God, under the reign of God. I want that. I want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, believing that everything will be added to me if I seek first the kingdom. So I surrender all to you. Amen. Sing this chorus. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. Sing it again. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. One more time, sing the chorus through. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. One more time through. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. Hey, look this way. Skylar talked to us about connection cards. Everybody take that out. If you re-surrendered your life to Jesus or surrendered for the first time, there's a place you to mark that on the back of the card. Go ahead and do that. List those prayer needs. Also, prepare to honor God with his tithe and our offering. Ushers, would you get in the position? Just a moment, the ushers are going to come and Justin, the team, they're going to lead us in that song and we're going to sing it lights out. And after the container passes you, that's your invitation to do things in this order. Stand, sing with the team. To in the four corners of this room, I just felt we needed to continue this for a few weeks. As you contemplate, am I living in the big kingdom of God or the little kingdom of me? At some point, go to these communion tables. Take a piece of bread dip it into juice remember his body broken his blood shed and just ask that this week God would give you the power to live out the big kingdom of God in your life prayer teams will then come they'll be here to serve you as long as we need to but don't 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 listen to this kind of teaching and let it escape do business with God for the next few minutes. Jonathan's going to bring down the temperature to the lights. Ushers are coming down. Ushers come forward. Justin, would you lead us in this song? Let's respond to God. Janet will give us direction from here. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours You can have it all, Lord Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on
this heart.